Hello and welcome to the second set of lectures in the course about genetic testing. If you recall, in the first set of lectures, we focused on the cell bio biology and the protein machinery that uh, makes cells perform the work they do and that are necessary for life. In the second set of introductory lectures, I would like to focus on how the information machinery is encoded in the genome, how the genome is organized, and how the genome is inherited. And so, in this basics of biology set of lectures, we're going to be starting to talk about genetics. Although, uh, there is a caveat. And the caveat is that uh, the information inheritance and transmission genetics and population genetics usually involves the uh, explanation of genetic variation. And if you go to a genetics course in a college or read a genetics textbook, genetic variation is the first thing that is introduced. Genetic variation being the differences between us in terms of our DNA and the subtle differences that occur between the DNA that we inherit from our fathers and from our, our mothers. Now, I'm not going to talk about genetic variation in this set of lectures at all because what I would like to convey is how the machinery functions. And in fact, the machinery of how uh, uh, organisms uh, transmit the information, the DNA from one generation to the next, how the DNA is read, how it makes RNA, how it is translated into protein, none of that requires the presence of genetic variation. Uh, in fact, genetic variation is a bit of a nuisance, really. And uh, as you might imagine, since it also causes disease. And uh, so in this set of lectures, we're only going to be focusing on the processes, on the cell biological processes that do the information maintenance and information encoding and information transmission. So with that said, um, let's, let me explain what, what I'm going to be talking about today. So, uh, fundamental to all of this nucleic acid st structure, we touched on that last time when we were talking about RNA. Uh, there are some DNA structure specifics that are essential for understanding DNA. We're going to talk about how the uh, chemical substance, DNA, is, uh, makes up the genome, which is arguably an information uh, uh, substance and not, a, not just a chemical substance. So DNA replication and cell cycle, and then how the DNA is packaged in the, in the nucleus uh, to make a functioning genome. Once you have a functioning genome, you need to talk about regulation, organization, and its transmission. So this is what we're going to talk about today. And again, uh, I hope you won't be disappointed that we're not talking about gen genetic variation yet. We're only going to be talking about how this stuff works and uh, it works in the absence of genetic variation, of course. Great, so uh, DNA and RNA are the two nucleic acids that are found in a cell. And if you recall from last lecture, uh, this cartoon of RNA here, which shows the backbone as this ribbon and then the bases as the individual uh, atomic resolution bonds and uh, atoms, uh, RNA is single-stranded, and in this particular case, it folded it back onto itself to make some base pairing. DNA, on contrast, is double-stranded, and uh, this distinction is, is fundamentally important. There is another fundamental distinction between DNA and RNA, and that has to do with the D in the DNA, and we're going to explain that um, in a moment. So, if you remember, where the name comes from for RNA, it's ribonucleic acid. <clears throat> Ribose is the sugar that is part of the backbone. Nucleic is because it's a DNA material, it, it's a material from the nucleus, isolated from the nucleus, and acid because it has these phosphates here. Uh, the molecular structure looks approximately like this, and the business end of all of this is the base. And uh, DNA looks very, very similar. So here we have RNA, um, and uh, when I show these kinds of structures, let me explain really quick what uh, they are, how you should read them. So non-carbon atoms are written out. So this is an oxygen, that's a phosphate, etc. Carbon atoms, if they are in complicated molecules, are not written out because there would be too many Cs here. 
And so what you have is uh, at, every, at every corner, you have a carbon atom. And carbon must have four bonds. And so if there's a bond missing, like in this case, one, two, three, there's a bond missing, that bond goes to hydrogen. And that hydrogen isn't shown either. So whenever you see these kinds of structures, um, every corner has a carbon. And when you have fewer than four bonds, there's a hydrogen. Now, in this case, for example, um, yes, this is also three. One, two, three, so there would be hydrogen here. One, two, three, there would be hydrogen here, etc. So this is RNA, or the, I should say this is a nucleotide, a ribonucleotide. And this is a so-called deoxyribonucleotide. This is DNA. And if you look closely, you'll see that this hydroxy here, this OH, oxygen, hydrogen, is missing. And in its place, as you can infer from the fact that there are only two bonds written here, is a single hydrogen. So that's why it's called deoxy, because it's missing that oxygen. The reason for that is uh, thought to be that um, when you have an oxygen here, this molecule is just ever so slightly less stable than this molecule. And we think that life started, at least information uh, uh, inheritance uh, in life started uh, with RNA molecules. And so probably what happened is that DNA sort of took over because it's a more stable molecule. And its job is to maintain uh, information stability over the generations. And so DNA evolved, it is thought, uh, without this oxygen because it's inherently more stable that way. OK, so ribonucleotide deoxy ribonucleotide. The way these are hooked together is as follows. You have uh, one nucleotide, another nucleotide, and this oxygen, the three prime oxygen, goes to this phosphate of the next nucleotide. And it releases this so-called pyrophosphate, two phosphate uh, molecules hooked up together, um, in a reaction uh, that is extremely energetically favorable. This is one of the most energetically favorable reactions in life, really. Um, getting rid of these two phosphates and hooking it up to an oxygen here at the previous base. <clears throat> The five prime, three prime direction, if you recall from last lecture, is annotated because this is the first carbon atom, second, third, fourth, fifth carbon atom of the ribose ring. And so from the perspective of a single nucleotide, um, the direction of synthesis always goes from five prime to three prime. So the next nucleotide is always hooked up at the three prime end. And it's never hooked up on the other end. So when we hook them up, let's look at a comparison of these single strands. So not the double strand. We'll get to that in a moment, but just the single strand, OK? So here's the backbone again, the ribose phosphate units. So ribose phosphate, ribose phosphate, et cetera. And uh, this is RNA, it, as you can tell by this OH here. And basically the same structure, except that that OH is missing in DNA. And also a minor uh, uh, difference here, and people use these interchangeably. RNA has a so-called uracil as this base, uh, whereas DNA has a thymine as this base. And the only difference between the two is that here at this carbon position in the thymine ring, there is a methyl group, a C carbon with three hydrogens, and that is not present here. Um, but other than that, the, the bases really are equivalent. And they're, in, they're equivalent in some very important ways. So um, again, the direction of, the, uh, of the, the way the backbone runs is 5 prime to 3 prime. So as we've seen before, uh, this is uh, a slightly more accurate representation of RNA and the way it folds up. Um, but the cartoon representation would be such that it is single-stranded. Okay, so there's really only one strand of RNA. 
DNA has two strands, and as you can see, they uh, go together in very specific ways. So again, if we just take a look at uh, RNA and DNA, uh, the two features that they really have in common is that there is the backbone from which the bases uh, stick out. Um, RNA only has one strand, DNA has two strands, and in the next section we'll go over the specifics of DNA. I would just like to make a point right now so that, and I will make this again, so that there is uh, no confusion about the single-stranded nature of RNA. Again, if you recall, DNA is double-stranded, um, RNA is single-stranded, and it is transcribed from the DNA using a template strand so that you have this single-stranded RNA as a product, okay? Now, if you recall, this single-stranded RNA has certain signals in it um, that will allow it to be translated into protein, okay? So, uh, there are three nucleotides each that each make a codon, and the codons via transfer RNAs and the ribosome are then translated into the protein chain, okay? The point that I want to make here, and again, I'll make it again, uh, is that this peptide sequence here that is encoded by this strand is different from the hypothetical peptide sequence that would be encoded by the other strand. All right? So for, if you assume for the moment that uh, you kind of have the choice um, that to either transcribe this strand or that strand, if you did transcribe this strand instead, you would start with T, C, T, T, A, T, etc. Completely different sequence from that, right? And if you translated that sequence into protein, it would be totally different protein. So DNA is sort of double-stranded in a way that we'll get into in a moment, okay? But once you convert the information in DNA to a single strand, it really does become direction dependent. This strand carries different information from the other strand. And uh, RNA is always directional. Okay. Now, uh, real quick, a summary of nucleic acids, the generalities. Uh, the building blocks are deoxyribonucleotides for DNA, ribonucleotides for RNA. The chains are made by hooking up the phosphate group of the next nucleotide with the three prime hydroxy on the previous sugar. And that energy, that uh, reaction is driven by the very high energy that is released when that bond is made. We have four bases, and we're going to look at the base pairing in a moment. Adenosine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine for DNA. Instead of thymine, you have uracil for RNA. And uh, these bases are classified into uh, two different types. The purines are the ones that have two rings um, that are the bigger bases, and the pyrimidines are the ones that only have a single ring that are the smaller bases. Um, G always pairs with C, A always pairs with T or, T or U, and the directionality of a single strand is, is set by the, by the sugar phosphate backbone. Okay, now the double helix. And uh, this is this is probably the only time that we'll ever talk about anything historic, but I would like to just briefly go over how the structure of DNA was determined. And uh, we usually hear about Watson and Crick, and I'll show them to you on the next slide. But um, a, a, probably the most important piece of information that came out of uh, the biochemical um, the biochemical field when when people were uh, thinking about uh, how what the DNA structure is was uh, the observation by Chargaff um, that the number of purines is the same as the number of pyrimidines in DNA. And again, the pyrimidines are the ones with a single ring, the purines are the ones with a double ring. Okay, so you have the same number, same number of these as these. And that the number of A's equals the number of T's and the number of G's equals the number of C's. And um, these came to be known as Chargaff rules, Chargaff's rules. Now, if you move forward, uh, and uh, from our perspective, where we know that DNA is a double helix, um, 
these rules make sense because G pairs with C, A pairs with T always. So that's there. And the fact that you have the same number of purines and pyrimidines is, is pretty simple. Even if you have an imbalance, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight purines on this strand, well, on the other strand, you're only going to have, to ha have two purines out of this 10 base pairs. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. So it's always equal. And this equality really led Watson and Crick to uh, propose, together with the crystal structure that Rosalind Franklin uh, had, had uh, obtained of DNA, to propose the double helical model. And uh, here they are with their, with their model of uh, the double helix of the DNA. I should also note that um, they weren't really supposed to see the data that Rosalind Franklin had generated, and they kind of uh, did that behind her back. But unfortunately, by the time the Nobel Prize came around, she had unfortunately passed away, so she was not able to be awarded the Nobel Prize for her seminal contribution, because she had, she had made the crystal structure from which uh, the double-stranded nature could be inferred to some extent. OK, so here's the molecular structure of the base pairing. And uh, what we're seeing here is C, A, G, T. And then the complementary strand is uh, A, C, T, G, written out like this. The amazing thing about this is that you can uh, turn it around, and it's the same information. So the way you look at it really doesn't matter. Now, the base pairing has a very important implication, which is that if you know one strand, you know the other. So given one, you know the other. Given Watson, you know Crick. And given Crick, you know Watson. OK? So if Watson base pairs with Crick like this, and you turn it around, it's the same. It's, there's no difference. However, if you made the mistake of not turning it around, but simply reading it backwards, you would get different information. You would get Nostov and Kirk. And that is different. OK? So, the relationship of uh, the two strands of DNA are referred to as reverse complementarity. Complementarity because they go together, and reverse is because you can turn them around. It's not backwards forwards. It's reverse complementarity. It's very important. So there is this uh, very, very important concept. If you pry the two strands of DNA apart, uh, which is referred to as melting or denaturing, uh, you can make the other strand using the information in the template strand. And DNA replication, which is the next section, how we make new DNA from previously existing DNA, uh, uses that trick. So uh, in terms of information maintenance, uh, it gives you the uh, uh, flavor of the fact that the double-stranded nature of DNA is, is a very, very effective uh, information retention material because of its reverse complementarity, which implies redundancy. You don't have to have both strands in order to know uh, the base sequence, but you need to make both strands in order to eventually maintain it and replicate it. And again, uh, the coding information is strand-dependent, reading something this way and making protein out of it is different from reading something this way and making protein out of it. OK. <clears throat> and uh, that's again highlighted here. So now that we've seen that uh, the double strand nature here, you can turn it around and still retain the information, that, that does not mean that you can read this to make protein from the other direction. OK. When you make an RNA and eventually make protein, the directionality in which you read it is, is uh, essential. OK, now how is uh, the information actually maintained? And uh, it's really conceptually quite simple. As I just explained, when you take the strands apart, 
uh, you don't actually lose any information. The, this strand here uh, has the information that's necessary to synthesize the other strand. And so uh, in this cartoon, what I'm simply showing is that uh, this might be 100,000 base pairs of DNA in your genome. And DNA replication proceeds such that this is unwound here. And this so-called leading strand is synthesized just using this as a template. And it goes on and on and on. And the lagging strand, and these are some technicalities that we really don't need to get into, the lagging strand has to be synthesized in little pieces. Um, because if you recall, the direction of synthesis is always uh, at the 3 prime end, 5 prime to 3 prime. And uh, if you did it uh, this way, you, it would be the wrong direction. So you have to do it this way, but these fragments then get stitched together in the end. So these are technical details, it doesn't matter. Basically, the cell has figured out how to uh, replicate DNA, uh, even though one strand has to be replicated in a discontinuous way. And, and so this goes on doing uh, DNA replication in many, many places in the genome. So just to orient you where uh, and when DNA replication occurs in the so-called cell cycle, let me show you this cartoon. Now remember, uh, for a cell, for a diploid cell, one chromosome from mom and one chromosome from dad, for a diploid cell to divide, it has to, of course, grow make uh, more protein and all of that. But at some point, it has to decide that you know I'm big enough. I need to uh, make two copies of each uh, chromosome uh, so that I can then divide. And that's referred to as the cell cycle. So in this state here, the cell does its job. If it's supposed to eventually divide, it will also grow. Um, at this stage here, it is making the DNA. It's duplicating, replicating DNA. That's the S phase, DNA synthesis phase. And <clears throat> once it has duplicated the DNA, it can then undergo mitosis and divide. And I'll show you some pretty pictures of mitosis. But let's focus on this here for, for a moment. Um, so in replication, uh, what you're making is another copy of both mom's DNA as well as pop's DNA, okay? So in the end, you have four copies of the same chromosome. Now, the same I'm saying because we're not talking about genetic variation yet. But uh, remember, uh, you have the diploid cell has one copy of mom, one copy of dad. After synthesis, you have another copy of each of them. And um, in the genome, there are many, many places in which this happens. Because as you might imagine, if you took a very large chromosome and started copying it from one end to the other, it just takes too much time. So what has to happen is that these replication origins have to be spaced in the genome such that uh, the DNA can be replicated in a, uh, in a coordinated fashion, mostly at the same time. So um, some calculations. So the average spacing of these origins of replication is approximately one every 100,000 base pairs or so, so 10 to the fifth. The, your genome size is approximately 3 billion uh, times 2, because you have one from mom, one from dad. So 6 billion. So if you divide the 6 billion here by the 10 to the fifth, you end up with approximately 60,000 60, replication origins in your genome. And um, they are in S phase, during synthesis phase, during replication phase, um, there are places, replication origins, that kind of start up early. And then uh, there's a phase when lots of them are firing and most of your DNA is being replicated, and then there are some that are kind of late. Um, they don't all go off at exactly the same time. There is some distribution. And depending on how the genome is, is uh, packaged away, uh, some fire early and some fire late. Uh, in the end, uh, the total time it takes for replicating the genome is, is a handful of hours. OK, so 
uh, once it's replicated, we need to segregate the chromosomes. And uh, in this pretty picture here, um, what you're seeing is uh, some cells that are in uh, interphase. Um, I don't know if it's before synthesis or after. Um, and then a cell that's beginning to condense its chromosomes, and then a cell that is beginning to segregate the chromosomes into daughter cells. And uh, the fact that this is an onion really shouldn't bother you, because uh, this stuff happens in all eukaryotic uh, cells, and it all looks the same. So here are some pretty pictures. Um, this is the start of mitosis, where uh, the DNA is labeled in blue, and you can see that the DNA is still kind of diffuse around uh, in, 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 the, in the cell. Uh, and these so-called microtubules here are uh, the, the roads, uh, the, the structures, the dynamic structures that will that basically provide the force to segregate the chromosomes. And uh, they're beginning to hook up to these red dots, which are the places where the microtubules grab a chromosome called centromere and then pull them apart. So here it's still rather diffuse and it's trying to sort out where to, where to grab things. Here um, the microtubules have attached to the centromeres and you can see that the chromosomes are beginning to look a little more uh, a little more tidy, a little more organized, and they're arranging themselves around this axis here. Then the microtubules begin to push each other away from each other, and uh, the chromosomes are now beginning to be really uh, separate from each other. And then finally, um, this is when the, uh, the two sets of chromosomes have ended up in really different places, and the two daughter cells will form here and here. So that's the process of mitosis. Um, it's a uh, universal process in, in diploid cells and diploid eukaryotes. And it happens uh, every time a cell divides. It's a very highly uh, stereotyped process. So speaking of cell divisions, uh, let me orient you for a moment um, as to uh, how many uh, cell divisions there really are. Um, in the growing organism, <clears throat> if you consider the lineage from a initial germ cell to uh, the next germ cell, so this is when you were a baby and this is when you're making babies, um, there are approximately 40 or so cell divisions, 40 cell generations that occur. But the power of exponential numbers is such that, um, of course, every, every one of these also divides, and then every one of those divides, etc. And so these 40 cell divisions give you the trillion cells, or actually it's slightly more than 40, the 100 trillion cells in your body. And uh, after about 30 cell divisions, uh, the embryo is, is at about um, a centimeter and a half of approximately a billion cells. So <clears throat> uh, there are, even though there are a trillion cell divisions that give rise to your trillion cells, or I should say a hundred trillion cells actually, uh, but you know, these are large numbers, who, who keeps count? Um, uh, even though there are that many cell divisions, any given cell has a lineage that has uh, only on the order of 40 cell divisions. Now, some stem cell derived cells have uh, more, but uh, on average, this is approximately right. So, and that's just, again, it's the power of exponential numbers. Okay. So, let's talk about how the chemical substance of DNA becomes a biological substance and how that is executed in the nucleus. So um, the chemical substance of DNA uh, in the nucleus of a cell is the chromosome, which is a contiguous piece of DNA that stores a portion of the total genetic information. And you know, it's kind of unclear why there are so many chromosomes. Uh, in principle, you don't have to have many chromosomes. You could have all your genome in a single chromosome that's super, super long. 
But for some reason, uh, biology has decided that um, it's better to have it chopped up to slightly smaller pieces. Um, in the human genome, we have 22 chromosomes and the X and the, and the Y uh, that range in size from about 50 million base pairs to about 250 million base pairs. Now, uh, 50 million, okay, the shortest chromosome, that is literally 50 million of these individual nucleotides hooked up to one another in one long, unbroken string. And of course, Watson is one strand, and then Crick is the complementary unbroken string, and together they make the double helix. Um, but it's 50 million units, and the big chromosomes have 250 million units, and then there are some interesting critters that I'll show you in a moment uh, that have really, really huge chromosomes, you know, a billion, a billion bits, a billion nucleotides in an unbroken chain. It's, it is truly remarkable. <clears throat> So if you have that many nucleotides in an unbroken chain, how long is that chain if you just strung it out? So three billion times two, uh, one base pair is 0.34 times 10 to the nine meters. So the 10 to the negative, 10 to the negative nine here, and the 10 to the nine, they cancel out. So you can do real math in your head really quick here. Three times 0.3 is approximately one. So in other words, the total length of a single genome is one meter. And the total length of both of your genomes, mom, dad, is two meters. If it were just a string. Okay, that's pretty mind boggling actually. So, Obviously, it doesn't fit into a cell. So what does the cell do? The cell has to package it somehow. Um, in fact, it has to fit into the nucleus, which is smaller than the cell. So the packaging has to be done really, really efficiently. And um, the first order of packaging uh, happens with uh, universally uh, important proteins called histones that um, together form multi multiple subunits of the histones that together form the so-called nucleosome. And the DNA in your cell, see there's a double-stranded DNA and the basis are these sticks here. Of course, these are all cartoons. Um, the DNA wraps around one and three quarter times around the nucleosome. So if you start here, follow the DNA around and then it comes out here. So one and a quarter times around this uh, protein complex. And then it gets packaged up more and condensed more, compacted more into um, eventually uh, a metaphase chromosome, mitotic chromosome. Although this particular uh, cartoon here is, is slightly misleading and I'll, I'll tell you in a moment why. Uh, because uh, you know, this state here, the fully condensed chromosome, does, does not contain any kind of uh, signal, uh, any kind of uh, DNA that is not packaged. Um, and uh, cells that do, uh, that are active, that are not being, where the chromosomes are not being segregated at the moment, they contain a mixture of these. So it's not like you start reading here and then it gets packaged up. This is simply just a cartoon to show you the different levels of organization of, of uh, hierarchical packing. And the, the fundamental first level is this histone uh, DNA interaction. Um, so when chromosomes are highly condensed, uh, they can be looked at under a microscope. And uh, you can sort them so that you put the, the various uh, individual chromosomes together so that you have a mother and father copy. And this is the way they look. Um, and I, I uh, just to foreshadow some of the genetic testing, of course, uh, this is the kind of uh, work that people have done in order to see if you have, for example, three copies of chromosome 21. Um, or if you have perhaps a, a, a chunk of DNA missing, a very large chunk of DNA missing, in which the case this banding pattern would be, would be different. Now this is the way it looks at the, towards the end of mitosis here. And there's the onion again. Of course, these chromosomes are different from those, but you can see that um, at least in terms of the general structure, it's very similar. Um, 
And so uh, these banding patterns have been, uh, th these pictures have been converted into, into stereotype banding patterns that are, um, that, that have a certain nomenclature. Uh, this is the P arm, here's the centromere, which is where the mitotic machinery grabs chromosomes to segregate, and then this is the Q arm. And uh, these bands are referred to by certain numbers, and the banding pattern of normal human chromosomes looks uh, approximately like this. Just pointing out that the Y chromosome looks very different from the X chromosome. But uh, all the autosomes here, the numbered chromosomes, are, of course, uh, very similar to one another, modular genetic variation. So um, that's the way it looks when you find a cell where the chromosomes have been condensed, uh, which is during mitosis. When the cell is actually actively doing its thing, uh, the chromosomes are not condensed. But rather, uh, only portions of them are condensed. And many regions are accessible for the gene regulatory machinery. So in summary, uh, double helix replication and packaging of chromosomes. The nucleic acid polarity is 5 prime to 3 prime. We have two anti-parallel strands in DNA. Uh, the DNA replication, the maintenance of the information passing on to the next cellular generation, is possible because one strand determines the other strand. And we colloquially refer to them as Watson and Crick. Uh, replication starts at repli replication origins. It goes in both directions. Uh, the two replication forks move divergently, making a replication bubble. Um, and there are approximately a 1,000 or so of these rep replication origins uh, across each chromosome, firing uh, mostly coordinated, but with some variance in the timing. Um, because the chromosomes are too long to fit into, into, inside the nucleus as a string, they must be packed up. There's multi-order packing. The first order is the nucleosome, where 150 base pairs wrap around the nucleosome, and then there's a bit of a linker region until you get to the nu next nucleosome. So the unit length there is approximately 200 base pairs. And then there's higher order packing facilitated by proteins that put the nucleosomes together, and even higher order packing that is a bit less well understood. In fact, there is sort of this dark zone in our understanding between the really super high, high order packing that gives rise to metaphase chromosomes and, and the uh, the lower order packing of, of nucleosomes. So during early mitosis, the chromosomes are condensed into maximally compact objects. Uh, that's necessary because you need to avoid breakage of the chromosome when you pull them apart. And uh, during the other phases, uh, large portions of the chromosomes are as condensed as well. Um, but uh, those are the ones that are not being used by the cell. The regions that are being used by the cell uh, are not condensed at that point. 